Shalom, and thank you for joining together again for our Torah portion. We're in the days of Or, and in the days of Or, this concludes the, the annual cycle of the Torah portion, the annual cycle of the Jewish year. There's an ending and a beginning. And this Torah ends with Deuteronomy, and it will begin with the book of Genesis. And interestingly, as you go through the year with the Torah, the Torah is a story that has a beginning, but it never actually has an end. It's something that always keeps going. You begin in the book of Genesis with the creation, and you describe how God starts the world, how everything was made. And then as you go through the Torah, you, you see that God chooses a family and that uh, the, this family gets trapped or goes down into Egypt where they become slaves and then they call out for redemption. There is redemption. There is the giving of, of the Torah. There's God being with his people as he leads them to the promised land. And the final book, the book of Deuteronomy, is the single longest monologue in the entire Bible. Moses, who had started his career saying to God, choose somebody else because I can't speak, ends up giving 34 chapters of this, the longest single monologue in the entire Bible. Somewhere along the line, he's really learned how to speak. But at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, you never actually get into the promised land. You simply stop with the death of Moses and you begin again in the book of Deuteronomy. So it's an interesting time during these days of awe as things draw to a close but then also start again, fresh, new, and exciting. And the uh, the adventure begins again. So the Torah portion we're going to be looking at today is called Ha'azinu, which means give ears, O heaven. And it's the Deuteronomy 32 to the end of the book of Deuteronomy. In Hebrew, this is called the Mishnah Torah or the second Torah, and that's the reason why in, in Greek it's called Deuteronomos, the second law. And there is a discussion within the Jewish world as to what exactly is Moses doing in his retelling of the Torah, because sometimes he, he adds information that we have never seen before. And in this Torah portion, he, he adds again something very interesting right before his death. He says something that the Israelites have never, never heard before. So we begin in Deuteronomy 32. And uh, I'm reading from the Net Bible. It doesn't matter which version you're reading. All versions have some positives and some negatives. Mine starts off with, listen, O heavens, and I will speak here, O earth, the words of my mouth. And it starts off with the phrase ha'azinu, which means uh, give me your ears. This is an oz, uh, oz nine, because you, you have two of them, so it's in plural. It doesn't use the word to hear, like shma, which the Bible could use, as it has used that word before. And that word uh, here, shma, is also the biblical word for obey. But that is not... What is being used here? Usually when Moses speaks or when God speaks to his people, he says, Shema, hear what I'm saying and obey them. Here, uh, this really is uh, and a case of listen that the things that I'm about to say, these are my last, very last words, and they're quite important. You might hear something you've never heard before. It could be challenging. It's the Bible. It probably is. It could be uh, uh it might make us ponder and contemplate, and perhaps we might not quite understand uh, everything, but God's ways are higher than our ways, and his understanding is better than ours, so we acknowledge that to be true. So what has God said through his servant Moses? In verse, uh, let's read verses 2, 3, and 4. My teaching will drop like rain. My sayings will drip like the dew. There will, there will be drops upon the grass and showers upon the new growth. It's beautiful um, poetry. A lot of Hebrew is a song or it's very much po po poetical form describing how God's word is watering the earth and making things grow fresh, alive, just and, and with a, often with a great smell, isn't it? Rain always has a good new smell to it. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord you must acknowledge the greatness of our God. As for the rock, God is often called a rock 
in 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 the, the Hebrew Bible, something that is strong, solid, uh, and in Jewish tradition, uh, a rock actually followed the children of Israel in the desert. Moses, uh, when when the children of Israel requested water in the desert, and they, it was a legitimate request because the desert doesn't have any, Moses strikes a rock and water comes out. And then later on, 39 years later, he's asked again to speak to a rock, and instead he strikes it. And in Jewish exegesis, they ask the question, so if Moses uh, struck a rock here and then he was supposed to speak to it, but he struck a rock there, where did Israel get the rest of the water in that time? And so in uh, in Jewish exegesis, they, they have a tradition that says that actually uh, the rock followed them. There was a moving rock that followed the children of Israel in the desert and was uh, uh, always pumping out water. Um, that might sound a bit fanciful and fine. Uh, however, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says that the rock that followed the children of Israel in the desert, that rock was the Messiah. So Paul makes uh, a reference to the tradition that there was a uh, the rolling rock that followed the children of Israel, and he references it as uh, the, the allegorically, the rock is the Messiah. He's always with you. He's always following. And you always have access to his living water at all times. Does Paul think that an actual rock followed the children of Israel in the desert? Not the point. The point is there was a, a tradition, and Paul makes good use of it to get his uh, theological point across. Here, God is described as a rock, and his work is perfect. That would be true. And in verse 4, it says, and all his ways are just. That's what my translation says, except that the Hebrew here says, Kol mishpat. All of God's ways are justice. The word is mishpat, which actually means justice. It's not a, an adjective to describe uh, uh, God's ways. It's a noun which says that everything that God does is justice, something called justice. Now, a mishpat uh, is in Hebrew, when you want to go to court, you go to what's called a beit mishpat, a house of justice. Uh, we would call those the municipal courts. And these are the, uh, the courts where you do go for justice. You, you see a judge who gives you a ruling called uh, a mishpat. Uh, uh, the same word, actually. What does it mean for uh, all of God's ways are justice? And this is one of the uh, interesting tensions that our Torah portion brings to us today. Everything God does is justice. Sometimes the things that we see him do, we don't acknowledge them as being justice or even just, um, particularly when he would do some smiting, do some judging. So he might hurl his wrath down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And those are horrible things, terrible, but that's still justice. God will forgive Cain after killing Abel. He will banish him, but he won't actually give any other, other harm. God will uh, bring wrath in revelation on the planet, but he will forgive a woman caught in adultery and say, go and sin no more. And so sometimes we don't quite always understand how God deals with the world or why he sets people free or why he should um, forgive my sin when he doesn't have to do that. In fact, for real justice, I should be punished for the things that I've done. But instead, everything God does is justice. And his justice is higher than our justice. And that is a good thing. And so while we might not always understand it, we can contemplate it, believe it, and hold on to it. That everything that God is doing in the world, though I don't quite understand, leads somehow to justice, real justice, divine justice, the justice that, that God actually has. I want to leap um, to verse 8, where in uh, my translation it says, when the Lord Most High gave the nations their inheritance, so all nations are given inheritance, not just the people of Israel, 
when he divided up humankind, when he divided up the sons of Adam, when he, when he um, apportioned land for everybody, everybody gets a portion of land. So it's not just that Israel gets a portion, everybody gets a portion. Uh, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Now, hang on. That's a bit of a problem because at the time of uh, Moses' writing, there's absolutely no way we can have the sons of Israel because none of them have been born yet. So either this is prophetic or... Now, this is where um, we need to understand that most of our translations are translating the Hebrew from what's called the Masoretic text, which is the traditional text, or Textus Receptus, as they sometimes say in the Latin, but Masoretic, Masoret. But to call a text, a, a, a piece of scripture, a traditional piece of scripture, you have to have a non-traditional piece of scripture. You have to have like another virgin, version, so like a, an NIV and a New King James. And um, so here you get your handy-dandy Septuagint. And the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew. Well, it's a Greek translation of the other version of Hebrew, which includes things like Apocrypha, which our Hebrew Bibles don't do that anymore. And in chapter 32, verse 8, it says, uh, he fixed the boundaries of the nations according to the, the number of the divine sons. So the B'nai Elohim, not the uh, B'nai Israel, which is what the Masoretic would say. What does this mean? Is that um, the divine sons or the heavenly beings, these are a reference to angels. This is a, a, a hint that we see in the early Hebraic understanding of angelology. The Jewish people, and therefore the early church, because they were Jewish believers in Jesus, had a very well-developed sense of angelology. There was the understanding that angels had ranks, they had names, they had jobs, and they were apportioned to, some, some of them were apportioned to actually guard uh, nations. And so Moses here, when he, in his final speech, is saying God has divided up the nations and each one of them has their their angel. You, of course, Israel, have Michael, Michael the Defender, whom we will see later in uh, the prophet Daniel. And may the angel Michael defend his people in this very difficult time at the moment. The last thing I'd like to draw our attention to this uh, this portion is in verse 6, where it says, Is this how you repay the Lord? Uh, Moses is talking to Israel, who he knows will not be obedient and will actually eventually go into exile. But he says, Is this how you repay the Lord, you foolish, unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator? He has made you and established you. Deuteronomy 32 verse 6 is the first time that God is called a father. Israel now has a new relationship with their God. This has never been said before, and it's one of the last things that Moses says to the people of Israel before they go into the land of Canaan to set up um, the new society that is supposed to be moral and just and ethical and a light to the nations. Moses is saying, your God is, is high, he's, he's great, he's the creator, he, everything he does is justice, uh, he has apportioned angels, he himself is the commander of heavenly armies. But for you, you have a special relationship with him, father to son. The relationship is now very, very deep and personal. The relationship goes beyond uh, all the, the mitzvot. It goes beyond the tabernacle service with all the sacrifices and the, and the divine worship. It goes beyond um, that form of, uh, of obedience, and it comes down to heart to heart, soul to soul, relationship, father to son. Moses is adding something here he has never added before in the Torah. He's adding that human and, and, and divine father-son relationship. Israel, you have a father, and that father 
the Lord God Almighty. He'll be your father whether you go into diaspora, into exile, or whether you stay obedient in the land. And, uh, and this is the relationship that we should have uh, also with God, our Heavenly Father. We call him that in our prayer, our Father who is in heaven. We have that ability to be able to say to God, and that is something we also should impart to our children. A relationship that can't be removed, a relationship that is so special and is not bound by geography and can be taken wherever our children go, into university, to college, into their workplace, into their own family lives, one would hope. And so this Torah portion, let's think of God as our rock who is always there being able to supply water. Everything he does is justice, even if we don't understand it. And he is our father. We have a unique relationship with him, far, far better than any other relationship of any other tradition. This is uh, the, the true one, the, God, the one that God wants to have with his people. And it's accessible for everybody. Uh, all we have to do is believe it. Thank you very much for listening. See you soon for Yom Kippur.